can honestly say that there isn't really anyone in the world that knows more about this field than these two guys. Thank you. Thank you to the Celia UK for the kind invitation. Um, so these are the questions which are listed in the abstract, so I'll go straight to the answers. Um, so um, the first question was how often does celiac disease present with neurological dysfunction? And as you can imagine, there's not much data in the public domain about this, but what we did with Dave in Sheffield is that we looked at, over a period of two years, how many patients he diagnosed with celiac disease in his gastro clinic and how many I diagnose in my neurology clinic on the basis of people coming with a neurological problem through which a diagnosis of celiac disease was made. And we found the ratio of seven to two, seven patients diagnosed with celiac disease in the gastrointestinal clinic to two diagnosed by me because of their neurological presentation. And we are now quite clear as to the commonest manifestations. And this is work that has been going over the last 20 years. Uh, in Sheffield. So uh, the last update I did on the database uh, contains 643 patients with uh, neurological problems in relation to gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. And you see that the commonest manifestations are ataxia, uh, followed by peripheral neuropathy. There are two types of neuropathy we see, the classic uh, length-dependent symmetrical peripheral neuropathy and then another one called the sensory ganglionopathy that purely affects sensory nerves. Then we have this entity we call the encephalopathy, and then a less common entity called myoclonic ataxia. Much less common manifestations include myopathies, myelopathies, and epilepsy with or without occipital classifications, and very rarely uh, chorea. So if we start with gluten ataxia, this is a sporadic idiopathic ataxia with uh, serological markers of sensitivity to gluten. At the time we started this work, uh, this was uh, anticladin antibodies, um, and it accounts for 17% of all ataxias and 40% of idiopathic sporadic ataxias. So this is a patient who presented to me something like 15 years down the line with an established ataxia through which uh, we made a diagnosis of celiac disease. You can see that it's got a very bloated abdomen and in fact... Could you just try with this finger to touch your nose gently? And you see how much disability there is um, okay. when you have already lost a lot of brain tissue, uh, particularly of the balance center. We did a study um, back in 2003 looking at the effect of the gluten-free diet and we were able to demonstrate that despite the fact that there's a lot of uh, brain tissue loss, you can actually achieve some improvement of the ataxia within a year of strict gluten-free diet, uh, even in those patients who actually didn't have enteropathy. Moving on to gluten neuropathy, this is a symmetrical length dependent sensory and motor neuropathy, again with serological markers of sensitivity to gluten, and the epidemiological work we've done shows that it accounts for 26% of all neuropathies and 34% of all idiopathic neuropathies. Um, we did a study that uh, lasted 10 years, um, showing that um, there was evidence of improvement of the neuropathy using neurophysiological assessments after strict adherence to a gluten-free diet. And again, this was irrespective of whether or not there was an underlying enteropathy. Gluten encephalopathy essentially means that the patient has intractable headaches, which can mimic migraine, um, but they often have a very high prevalence of white matter abnormalities on MR imaging. And this was originally reported by us as headache and white matter abnormalities back in 2001. The key uh, issue here is that when the patient goes on to a gluten-free diet, the headache disappears. And the range of abnormalities, which Nigel Hogart will talk a bit about later, can be uh, quite extreme, like in this case here, to much more focal, like in these cases here. These changes don't tend to revert to normality, but you'll see later that they can actually get worse if um, uh, you don't go to a gluten-free diet. Uh, 
Now, this is the entity we called hyperexcitable brain and refractor, refractory celiac disease. So this patient, in addition to having ataxia, uh, has a very jerky tremor, uh, which is uh, extremely disabling. You can see that the legs are constantly jerking. And what we found is that this condition is strongly associated with refractory celiac disease. And in fact, two of our patients develop enteropathy-associated lymphoma. So it's a very difficult condition to treat and very, very disabling. So it's virtually impossible to uh, function at a reasonable stage with this uh, very disabling problem. If you do clever neurophysiology on these cases, you can demonstrate that uh, preceding each of the myoclonic check, there is a spike in the contralateral cortex, which tells you that it's all coming from the brain. How common is neurological dysfunction in patients with established celiac disease on diet? Uh, again, a difficult figure to come up with, but if you look at the literature, the figures vary uh, from 10 to 30 percent. But of course, it depends very much as to who collects the data. Is it the neurologist or is it the gastroenterologist? The type of manifestation, uh, is it a chance association as opposed to being linked to the celiac disease? And of course, the extent of the investigations. Are you doing a brain scan? Are you doing an F-conduction study? There's some evidence that there might be some geographical variations and that the neurological uh, manifestations may be a bit more uh, prevalent in the UK. Uh, and, and of course, the duration and strictness of the diet uh, plays a role as well. So we looked at a consecutive 33 patients referred by Dave uh, to me. Uh, the selection criteria was uh, based on whether the patient complained of headaches, balance problems, or sensory loss. So those were the three questions asked. And the patients underwent neurological examination and brain imaging. And of those patients, uh, MR spectroscopy, which again, Nigel will talk about a bit later, uh, showed abnormalities in 50%. And if you look at the cerebellar volume in that group, uh, it was uh, significantly less by comparison to healthy age match controls. Um, so this is uh, something called voxel-based morphometry that tells you, you compare a group of patients with a particular condition to a healthy control. And anything that comes up as yellow or orange uh, suggests that they have reduced uh, gray matter by comparison to the healthy controls. So you see that the top part of the cerebellum is involved here. But also there are other interesting areas that are um, affected. The inferior frontal area, which is uh, implicated in depression and anxiety. The thalamus, which of course is the main uh, sensory uh, processing organ in the brain, and of course a lot of patients with celiac disease complain of sensory symptoms which are not due to peripheral neuropathy. So how common is neurological dysfunction in patients with newly diagnosed celiac disease? So this is uh, fresh off the press, so to speak, because I, the study was completed last week. This is funded by Celiac UK. It took three years to complete, uh, but we now have uh, almost a complete uh, data set. So the patients uh, um, were patients who were newly diagnosed with celiac disease, and they all underwent a neurological examination followed by brain imaging. Uh, and as I said, it was completed last week by coincidence. Uh, so these are the fresh data from 100 consecutive patients. 61% had neurological symptoms. 45% had intractable headaches. I'm not talking about have you ever had a headache? I'm talking about headaches, which are daily headaches, more or less. 26% uh, when asked complain of balance problems, and 14% complain of sensory symptoms. And 42% had evidence of neurological dysfunction on clinical examination, uh, 38 of which had evidence of cerebellar dysfunction, including nine having actual nystagmus when you examine their eye movements, and 5% had sensory signs. One patient had myoclonus, a bit like the patient. So most of you should be able to stand on one leg, provided you haven't had something to drink. But you see that this is not normal. Uh, and if you get the patient to try and walk in tandem, 
Again, she's having problems with uh, walking in tandem. So the, the abnormalities are much more mild by comparison to the other cases I showed you, but nonetheless are there. Uh, when we uh, did the imaging on these patients, 44% uh, had abnormal MR spectroscopy versus 3% in the controls, uh, and 56% of patients with abnormal MR spectroscopy had clinical evidence of balance problems. 29% had these white matter changes that I showed you before, as opposed to 10% in controls. And out of 40% of patients with white matter abnormalities complained of headaches, which is the uh, symptom associated with those. Now, what are the differences between patients presenting with neurological versus those with gastrointestinal symptomatology? Well, those who come to me with a neurological problem are much older. Uh, so the mean age is 61 versus 47 in those presented with celiac disease to gastroenterologists. They are neurologically more severely affected at the time of presentation. It's as if they've missed the boat of making a diagnosis earlier that would have protected them from developing a neurological problem. The diet, of course, has a stabilizing effect, but they remain disabled, uh, particularly if they had the ataxia for many years. And based on this prospective study, and I'm sure that's true in your cohorts as well, 46% uh, of patients with newly diagnosed celiac disease had positive serology at one year. And of course, adherence to the diet in the neurological cohort might be more important than in the gastrointestinal cohort. If you compare the, the uh, voxel-based morphometry in these two groups, you'll see that those with, uh, presented with a cerebellar problem, to me, have a much more uh, severely affected cerebellum by comparison to the newly diagnosed patients with celiac disease. And of course, um, with the bowel, you can uh, eat gluten and uh, get a flat mucosa, or you can go back onto the diet and go this way, and that can be, uh, you can be going both ways all the time. But when it comes to the brain, once you lose your Purkinje cells uh, here, uh, then there's no way back. So here's a, a cerebellum from a patient with gluten ataxia showing uh, just one Purkinje cell remaining in this section. So obviously the patient would, be, would have been very ataxic. Here's an MRI showing the cerebellum uh, before and after uh, a diagnosis of celiac disease was, was made on this patient. And the difference in these two scans is only about 18 months. So in some patients, it can progress extremely rapidly. OK, a bit about neurological dysfunction in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, the new term that has been introduced recently. Um, of the cohort of patients that I spoke about at the beginning, the over 600 patients, 41%, uh, uh, these are patients with neurological presentation, had celiac disease on biopsy. 37% um, have positive serology, but no enteropathy, but they have the correct HLA, so either DQ2 or DQ8. So I guess this you might call potential celiac disease. That leaves 22% of patients with neurological presentation and positive serology that had no enteropathy, but had a, a different HLA to DQ2 or DQ8. So in my book, that would be the group that you might call non-celiac gluten sensitivity. If you look at the distribution of ataxia in those three groups, uh, it was very similar. If you look at the distribution of neuropathies, they seem to be overrepresented in the poten potential group, 42% by comparison to the other two groups. If you look at the encephalopathy with white matter abnormalities, then they are more likely to have an enteropathy, 21% versus 8% in the non-celiac gluten sensitivity. But the most important point is that all three groups respond to a gluten-free diet. So you'll be justified to prescribe gluten-free diet even if there's no evidence of enteropathy. A bit about the pathophysiology, where we know that there's an inflammatory process. This is from a cerebellum of a patient with uh, gluten ataxia showing perivascular coughing with lymphocytes. That leads to the uh, story of the transglutaminase uh, enzymes, which are uh, enzymes that cross-link glutamine donor proteins. Uh, 
There are different types, and of course, uh, a major breakthrough in the pathophysiology of celiac disease came when TG2 was found to be the onto antigen in celiac disease. And of course, subsequent to that, TG3 was found to be the onto antigen in dermatitis herpetiformis. Uh, interestingly, these uh, two, three rather, uh, types of transglutaminase, TG6, uh, belong to the same gene cluster. So it made sense that perhaps this antibody could, uh, this antigen might be important in the neurological manifestation. So we started a very fruitful collaboration where we were able to show that uh, the antibody targeting uh, in, uh, in the uh, gluten ataxia cohort seemed to be more towards TG6 rather than TG2 uh, or TG3. And then TG6 uh, uh, is, is becoming a, a, a tool for making a diagnosis of neurological manifestations, although it's not yet uh, widely available. But when we looked at the original cohort of patients with uh, gluten ataxia defined as ataxia with positive antigladin antibodies, 73 of them, uh, percent of them had positive TG6. But perhaps even more importantly, 32% of patients with idiopathic ataxia who are negative for any serology of gluten-related diseases were positive for TG6 and responded to a gluten-free diet. And in the prospective study that um, I was referring to earlier, these again are very new data, 40% um, of patients with newly diagnosed celiac disease had, uh, were positive for TG6. 94% of patients with positive TGCs had one or more of neurological symptom, abnormal examination, and or abnormal MRI scan. 78% of patients with positive TGCs had abnormal examination and abnormal scan versus 49% of those patients negative for TG6. So it's be beginning to show that perhaps TG6 is going to be an important marker for this cohort of patients. There's still burning questions. What determines the target of the autoimmune response leading to the primary clinical manifestation? And can we predict the development of extraintestinal manifestations by the presence of those antibodies? So um, the only way you can do that is if you find patients that are not uh, willing to go on a gluten-free diet, which is usually rare. But here's one such patient who presented to us um, uh, back in the late 90s with uh, headache and white matter abnormalities on the brain scan, through which we made a diagnosis of celiac disease. And we have follow-up now for 17 years. Uh, and we had a serum from baseline, which uh, uh, Daniel analyzed and showed that the, uh, the patient was positive for antibodies to TG2, TG3, and TG6 never been on the gluten-free diet. Um, you can watch his uh, cerebellum uh, shrinking over time, unfortunately, and despite that, he's not keen to go on the gluten-free diet. Um, but mo perhaps even more interestingly is that he's now developed dermatitis herpetiformis. Uh, so the implication being that if you have that antibody at the beginning, then you might be more at risk of developing these additional extraintestinal manifestations. And perhaps that may make it more uh, increase your likelihood of going onto a gluten-free diet and sticking to it. Uh, finally, um, despite all this work over 20 years, uh, my, my heart sinks when I, I see this uh, letter. So this is a, a referral letter from a tertiary uh, for uh, audiovestibular physician to myself. Uh, about a patient who, um, a lady, she was referred to uh, her with persistent disequilibrium and episodic dizzy spells, which can last for several hours. She described this as swimming sensation in the head. She also complained of rushing tinnitus and intermittent <coughs> pressure sensation in the left ear. Although she had many years like symptoms, she never actually developed a hearing loss. Therefore, many years was unlikely. Blood test showed weekly positive TTG and positive endomycin antibodies and she's been referred to my clinic. I refer her to a gastroenterologist in order to confirm or refute the diagnosis of celiac disease, as she did not have any gastrointestinal symptoms. He did not feel the need to proceed with a biopsy. I would therefore appreciate if you could kindly see her in your clinic for further investigation. One hopes that this will disappear from, uh, from a common practice. Uh, and with that, um, I wanted to thank my colleagues uh, from Sheffield, Dave, Nigel,
uh, Daniel Eshleman from Cardiff, because without their help and support, I don't think this work would have been possible. So thank you very much for listening. So uh, as, as Dave said, and Nigel uh, has the knowledge of what the brain of a, of a celiac disease patient looks, um, so he'll tell us about it. Thanks, Morris. Um, so I, I'm a visual person, so I get lots of pictures in my talk and, and, and fewer words. Um, we uh, are going to take you, go on a journey, and I'm going to take you through the journey of where the imaging of the neurological uh, symptoms and problems arising from gluten sensitivity have, have taken us. So I guess we've got to start by working out where we've come from. And uh, this is the typical kind of imaging you got of, uh, of gluten sensitivity in the 1980s. We didn't do it. We didn't look. There wasn't any. Uh, until the work of Marios and people highlighting this, it just didn't register. Um, this was the first area which we started looking at in the 1990s. We um, can do these um, um, an anatomical kind of appreciation of the loss of volume in the, in the cerebellum. You can see that um, you can see that the, this, this is the black stuff here is CSF, and you can see that that increases in volume as you go from left to right. And you can put a label on it. We could put a number on it. it would sound more scientific. We put numbers on it, but we but you know it means the same thing. Then the other area which we've uh, took an interest in was the white matter abnormalities. And you can see that you can demonstrate these on these are, are T2 weighted images. This shows up fluid as bright. And so normal um, white matter here um, should have a lot of lipid in it, a relatively low amount of water. And the areas of uh, signal change here represent gliosis, which has a much higher water content, so it appears bright on these scans. And um, if you want to, you can count them. And that's about as far as we got in the 1990s. We then move on to the, to the noughties, and uh, we started looking at, uh, you see the buzzword biomarkers appearing, uh, and uh, as well as looking at the uh, white matter abnormalities and clinically grading them in terms of number, you can also now do this uh, thing called uh, grading to various um, uh, clinical endpoints like Vasicas, but there are various other ones, and uh, they therefore link these uh, appearances back to the patient's um, prognosis and patients' manifestations in terms of their everyday life. This is the uh, one that we introduced in, uh, in, in Sheffield, which um, we started looking at spectroscopy now. Um, spectroscopy has been used for decades in organic chemistry. And what it basically does is looks at um, the actual resonance, the frequency of the spin on hydrogen atoms as they're attached to various chemicals. And there are three, I mean, you know, the brain is a soup of chemicals, but there are three very consistent peaks that arise. And these are, these are one which we label NAA, which is anacetyl um, cetazolamide. And what it actually does in the brain, nobody's entirely sure, but it's a membrane-bound bound protein. And that is produced by happy, healthy neurons. So if you lose neurons, it drops, and it drops permanently. But equally, if you stress neurons for any particular reason, then it has a chance to come back. The next one, which we've got in the middle, which is labelled CR, that's creatine. This is a reflector of the metabolism of the underlying brain tissue. And surprisingly, this doesn't really change. Um, it doesn't change particularly in tumours, it doesn't change in, in degenerative disease, it's fairly constant. So we often express changes in the other metabolites in terms of a ratio to this. And then the third one we label as, as, as CHO, and that's um, to do with membranes. And so that increases if you have increased numbers of membranes within the, within the area that you're looking at the brain, or um, if there are increased turnover of it, such as a tumour or, or demyelination. And basically, you can look at this in, in very simplistic terms and look at the, 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 the graphs that you see of these peaks. And if it's going in that direction, that's good, because NAA should be high. And uh, when NAA drops, you get this angle here, and that's bad. If you look at the spectroscopy um, from the cerebellum, one of the important things is where you put your region of interest. Okay? And our very, you know, the, the first work being published on this uh, was looking at the dentate nucleus. Now, the dentate nucleus is the source of most of the out, output of the cerebellum. And to be honest, it wasn't terribly helpful. And then I remember having this conversation with Maris one afternoon in the MR uh, uh, scanning room. And we, and we were talking about, well, 
well, what's the histology look like in these patients? And so we got down to the histology, we worked out where the Purkinje cells that were being lost were, and then we developed our regions of interest from that point. And from then on, um, we had a working, useful test. Okay? And uh, we have a voxel interest over the vermis, and we have a voxel of interest over the hemisphere. And they are looking at, basically, the, the cortical grey matter of the cerebellum, because that's where we're going to find the Purkinje cells, or not find them if they're missing. You can see on this uh, diagram here, this is from one of the studies that Maris has already mentioned. So these are the people being referred with an established diagnosis of celiac disease and being um, referred to Maris because they've got neurological symptoms. And you can look at this. This is the spectroscopy results from the cerebellum, from the vermis, not from the hemisphere, because it's the vermis that tends to be affected worse. And you can see that it's much more prevalent in the patients with balance problems that you'd expect compared to those with headache, which is a predominantly uh, a white matter problem that uh, those people seem to have. Okay, so that's where we've come from. Now, I, uh, I work in an in, in a, in a area of uh, science which is just changing all the time. And what you can do with imaging changes on a year by year basis. So let's have a look at where we can go. Um, we can start looking at uh, things in a more measured way. So we can start measuring volumes of things, and we can start trying to relate these ob uh, to objective measures of patient experience and patient function. And then there are a whole new raft of imaging techniques that have come through with improvements in MR technology. So starting off with the anatomical approach, you can measure cerebellar volume with fancy software, and it separates the brain automatically from the rest of the tissues, and then you find the edges of that, map it onto some predetermined models of how you think a brain should look, and then you can measure volumes. And this is the measurement of the cerebellar volume by a process called voxel-based morphometry. But what you actually find is there are a couple of limitations. One is that voxel-based morphometry is great when you've got groups of people, but when it comes to the individual patient in front of you, it, does, it breaks down. Okay, because my cerebellum could be smaller than your cerebellum, could be bigger than their cerebellum. It breaks down, okay? But for group comparisons, it works very well. If you look at the actual measuring the absolute values and then try and relate that to the total intracranial volume, the reason we do that um, is that it is deemed that the total intracranial volume represents the high tide mark of your brain size, okay? So whatever we measure ourselves at after about the age of 18, our brains will have shrunk a bit. And so you have to try and work out some mark of how brain there was, the brain was originally before whatever disease process may have started. So we correct these cerebellar volume measurements to intracranial brain volume. And if you look at it, um, we've got some interesting results. So if you look at the cerebellar volume in, in the celiac patient group that we've just uh, been talking about, those with neurological symptoms, it's clearly significantly smaller than normal healthy controls. And then if you look at those with a balance disturbance, it's clearly significantly more atrophied in that group than it is in those um, with just celiac disease and um, neurological symptoms. So we can see that we've got some correlation of our measurement with the clinical manifestations of the patient. We can then move on to with, um, developing other areas. I mean, that's the, an anatomical approach, but there's more to the brain than that, and it misses out a huge range of what we can look at with MR. And we need to start looking at the, at the functional aspects, the physiology of the brain. And one of the obvious places to start is looking at the blood supply, because in the brain, um, activity, brain activity, is very closely linked and coupled to the blood supply. And there's a few ways of doing this. And this is uh, one called arterial spin labelling. And what uh, you do with this technique is that you label magnetically, you tag the water in the blood coming up to the brain. And as you can see, if you've got areas of grey matter, so the dark stuff here, this is, this is the dentate nucleus. It looks darker because it uh, absorbs iron as you get older. Uh, but you can see that on our, on our measurement here of the flow, that it's brighter. And then you've got a zone here of darker signal and that represents pure white matter. And the white matter is not as metabolically active as the, as the gray matter, and therefore it has a lower blood supply, which is what we're measuring here. And then you've got this zone further out of uh, fairly high signal, 
And it looks a different shade of, of, of grey on this T2A imaging, and that's because it's a mixture of that darker white matter and a mixture of the grey matter. So we can see that we've got something which we can quantify over time that's reasonably reproducible. I mean, it's technically difficult to get it started, but we've, uh, we've cracked that and, and it's reproducible in our hands. And this is a, a patient we imaged recently with uh, gluten-related ataxia. And you can see, yes, uh, there's obvious atrophy there, but also there's grossly reduced perfusion here. So it may be this is something that will change over minutes or hours, as opposed to having to wait for changes that occur over years or maybe even decades. There are other perfusion techniques, okay? One is, um, the nice thing about uh, arterial spin labelling is there are no injections, okay? You just, uh, you're just magnetically labelling the water. There are alternative approaches where you inject uh, normal clinical MR contrast agent, and that can be used to assess the blood-brain barrier. Now, why does this matter? Well, the blood-brain barrier is a quite a good marker for endothelial cell function, and we'll come on to that in a moment, but that uh, is, is possibly a very important thing. So what happens when we try and measure this uh, agent is that your contrast agent um, is circulating in the capillary, this is brain tissue on either side, and a certain proportion of that will leak across. And we can measure that leakiness by measuring the signal that we get on our MR uh, scan over time. And that relates to the, this permeability relates to, to, to the endothelial function. And when we're looking at white matter disease, um, there's a lot of evidence that in normal um, vascular patients, shall I call it, the white matter disease is related to endothelial dysfunction. Now in the con a context of celiac disease, this is all to be decided, okay? There may be, it may be the same risk factors, the same sort of dysfunction that you get in normal uh, vascular disease that's happening in, in celiac disease, or it may be that there are other additional factors such as an immunological approach. Now then, um, another aspect of, of um, cerebellar um, physiology then that we can measure is the wiring, okay? Because yes, you can measure you can measure the, the, the output fibre uh, widths. These are the peduncles, this is the main output fibres, how the cerebellum communicates with the rest of the brain. And you can measure those accurately um, with, with, with these volumetric images. But there's also more information than that because this is diffusion tensor imaging. And what that does is um, allow you to measure the direction of these fibre tracks. So you can see here, it's quite um, clear, isn't it? This is the spinal cord. So up and down, the brain is going in, it's coded blue, left to right, right to left is coded red, and coming in a, out of the uh, plane of the image, front and back of the brain is coded green. And these are the peduncles, okay? And we can measure not just um, the uh, size of those, but also the amount of um, orientation they have, which uh, is very important in white matter disease because the degree of orientationness of, of, of the fibre tracks um, is reduced when you have any kind of inflammatory or any kind of destructive process which is affecting them. And this has been linked um, in, in, in lots of studies now with reduced cognitive performance. Okay? So this is a manifestation of something that a patient may get as problems with um, making decisions, uh, the memory might be poorer. So the, the, this is a physical representation of some of the underlying pathology that occurs. Um, what else can we do? Well, um, reductionist approach to science has been in for, for many decades, but we're now, particularly in brain research, um, have moved on to something where we're looking at um, Sometimes the th uh, what you see uh, with the reductionist approach is that you get um, you separate things out, you divide them up, you end up with less than the sum, and sometimes the sum of the parts is greater than the uh, than the components. And resting state fMRI is using the differences that occur in signal on the MR image depending on the amount of blood with oxygen in it um, reaching the brain tissue, and then it measures it over time. And this uh, activity kind of ebbs and flows fairly slowly. It's only about, um, it's got a frequency of about 0.1 hertz, so, you know, over 10 seconds or so. And what we ask people to do when we do fMRI is quite easy. You just have to lie in the scanner and think of nothing. 
Well, of course you're not thinking of nothing, you're thinking of all sorts of things. And this is that resting activity that occurs. And so we can measure this over time, and you get these um, wavy lines, which is uh, the actual signal. But then you can do some in, um, quite nice computing on this, and you can work out areas which are associated with other areas in terms of their functional activity. So if one bit of brain is active at the same time, if you keep doing the, 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 the analysis over long enough, then it's likely that they're communicating with each other and they're in some kind of system that's doing something. Now this is um, very much flavour of the month and there's huge amounts of effort around it trying to use it to look at Alzheimer's disease and other cognitive problems. And um, it's something that uh, maybe we should think about using in, in our cohorts. Um, this is, um, coming back to the cerebellum, this is uh, what you can see if you look at the cerebellum. This is a normal patient. Uh, and this is what happens. This is actually from an experiment we did um, looking at the effects of alcohol. This is a, a couple of bottles, of, uh, bottles, a couple of glasses of vodka. Um, if you're a couple of bottles, you'd be more than that, I tell you. Um, <laughs> and, and these are all the areas of the cerebellum. They don't function as it would do in normality. Okay? And clearly, if we went back to that patient who had the abnormal arterial spin labelling, they would be profoundly different function here. Profoundly different. <coughs> Okay, so we've done where we can go, so where do we want to go? Um, I think um, we need to work out, um, we need more work looking at patient experience versus these biomarkers. We haven't got enough there, we need to do more to work out what it represents. Um, and the reason why I think uh, that's important is, um, if you look at this patient, this is what happened over a 30 month period. So. She, uh, this person stuck to their gluten-free diet and they had a symptomatic improvement. And you can see that despite this is severe atrophy okay, of the cerebellum. Yet despite that, the, the, the spectroscopy was reflecting her functional, her clinical, her personal experience of improvement in her symptoms. So this is very important that we try and analyse this and try and see if we can quantify it. How accurate is it? How generalisable is it? The other area I think we need to look at are what those white matter disease changes actually mean. Um, yes, we can count them. We can see that uh, they're associated with the headache, but they're also present in other manifestations of uh, celiac-related uh, neurological disease. And um, they can progress. And this is a, a, a lady who, just over three years, we see goes from what I would call, you know, um, this would get, if I was a clinical report, this would be a moderate to this is severe, this is confluent white matter change. Okay? Now, what that represents in terms of her symptoms, I don't know and, and nobody else does until we start looking at it more closely. And this is where the, going back to the DTI, because the DTI is the wiring of the brain. And what white matter disease does is it disconnects bits of brain. So you get um, changes in, in the ability of those different coordinated areas of activity demonstrated by the resting state to communicate with each other because the white matter wiring is damaged. <coughs> and this is uh, another uh, finding which uh, Maris alluded to in his talk. This is grey matter volume loss. And uh, this is the hallmark of uh, lots of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, such as uh, frontotemporal dementia. There are lots of conditions that do this. But what we don't have a handle on is what the actual cognitive consequences in this patient group are of this process, of the white matter process. Do they feed in? Are there other factors that, that, that make them um, um, bad news in certain patients if you happen to have blood pressure or if you happen to have diabetes? We need to, there's lots of questions to be answered here. And so this is where I, I think we ought to be going. And I think we need to look at these, these, these three, three areas in particular, and in particular in the context of cognitive performance and linking biomarkers with disease experience. I'd just like to thank all these people who... Um, we're very much a team, and uh, uh, all these people have very important parts to play in us uh, doing this work. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can squeeze one question in. Any questions from the floor? Jeff. Yes, thank you. Jeff Holmes from Derby. I followed uh, this concept, Marius, ever since you 
introduced it, I think, in 96, you know, on your Lancet paper, not unexpectedly, uh, there was a lot of opposition. People said it didn't exist, nothing to do with gluten. Um, what I really wanted to ask is, in view of your continuing researches, have you managed to see off all the opposition, or are there still neurologists of standing who are very skeptical about it? Um, I think um, I think things are better. Uh, I used to have a slide where uh, there was a, an escape hatch behind, saying if you are going to start talking about gluten attacks, yeah, you know where to go. Uh, I think that, I think it's encouraging because I, I get uh, on a weekly basis emails from colleagues, neurology colleagues, who have made a diagnosis of gluten ataxia and there are patients with ataxia asking how do you treat, what do you do, should we be doing anything else? So that number is increasing. Um, but I'm afraid that uh, there's, still, uh, there's still some opposition uh, and, um, and I, I guess um, all you can do is just continue to um, uh, work in the field and just hopefully convince everybody. Because the problem is that if you don't make an early diagnosis, you end up with a very disabled uh, patient. And I find it difficult to, to believe that patients, uh, physicians who are faced with somebody with ataxia who has positive serology, whatever that serology is, and they have no other explanation for the patient's ataxia, are reluctant to recommend to the patient to go on a gluten-free diet as a means of stopping them getting worse. I think that's criminal. <laughs> okay, I think we'll close that. Thank you very much. Thank you.